Okay, I'll, let's, I'll turn it over to you, Kelly. Thanks, Jeremy. So welcome everyone to Intersections of Culture, the experiences of heritage connected Fulbrighters. Um, as Jeremy said earlier, I'm Kelly Swayze, the diversity and inclusion liaison for Fulbright programs in East Asia and the Pacific. And along with Jeremy Gaman Sperling, the diversity and inclusion liaison for Western Hemisphere programs, we're really thrilled to be hosting this event today and grateful for our fantastic lineup of speakers who will be leading us in the discussion. Before going into our opening remarks, we'd like to express our appreciation to our colleagues at the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs of the US State Department for their support in making these events possible. Fulbright commissions and posts for recommending our panelists, uh, Valeria Benitez for her work on our marketing materials, and to our colleagues around the globe for supporting us in promoting this event. Our speakers today, Maisi Chang, Frishta Kaderi, Ruby Flores, and Dr. Delicia Jolly, as well as our moderator, Tan Mai of Fulbright Lotus, have been invited to speak to us today on the topic of heritage connected grantees. Each brings their expertise to share through both their advocacy and academic work, as well as their personal experiences that will help us reflect on and unpack the concept of heritage connected individuals in the context of educational exchange. In recent years, an increasing number of students from the United States who engage in educational exchange have studied abroad in countries in which they have cultural, linguistic, and or ancestral ties. As this population has grown, scholars and practitioners have sought names to define and understand this unique experience. One of the more popular terms has been heritage students, developed from the designation for students in the US who enroll in language classes of a language other than English, that is associated with one's cultural background that may or may not be spoken in the home. The Institute of International Education coined the designation heritage seeker to refer to a student who is drawn to study abroad in a particular country and culture, not because it is unfamiliar and new, but rather because it is somewhat familiar. In our case, we have decided on the term heritage connected Fulbrighters, as we know that the primary motivation of participants who would be considered a heritage seeker is not always to reconnect with their heritage, and that reconnection may in fact be much more complicated than we think. One of our goals in holding this event today is to explore the experiences and center the voices of heritage connected Fulbrighters who have participated in Fulbright programs around the globe. Although the category of heritage seekers or heritage language learners or even Heritage Connected has gained more visibility in contemporary discussion of higher education, we believe it important to create a space that allows us to explore what we can do in international education to understand the breadth of motivations, challenges, joys, and triumphs that are part of the experiences of this community. We also wanna critically engage with the concept of quote unquote having heritage and the political and social context that shapes this designation. Recognizing that this term encompasses a heterogeneous group with various backgrounds and motivations for engaging in study and scholarship abroad, we want this panel to provide space to reflect on that term in this usage. Are there other ways that we can define these experiences and identities of heritage? Unpacking the term will also allow the panel to explore the larger historical and geopolitical dynamics at play, including the social and historical conditions that make being a quote unquote heritage connected student a possibility as well as the implications that this entails in the context of theories, whether in international education, international politics, and post-colonial studies. In particular, we want this panel to be a place to openly explore the struggles of negotiating between the cultures and societies of the host country that they are connected to, and our identities and their identities as people from the United States. Finally, by sharing and amplifying the experiences of heritage-seeking participants through a DEIA approach, this panel aims to build knowledge and develop structures of support that can be utilized to address the needs of heritage participants in Fulbright programs globally. Before we turn the floor over to our speakers today, we'd like to just briefly introduce them. Um, so first, I'd like to start with our moderator, Tan Mai. Tan was a participant in the ETA program in Belgium from 2018 to 2019. She's the co-founder of Fulbright Lotus, a DEI initiative that advocates on behalf of Asian Fulbrighters. And she currently lives in New York City and works at an educational nonprofit. Next, we have Frishta Kaderi. Frishta was a participant in the US Student Research Program in Uzbekistan from 2020 to 2021, where she spent the year studying female participation in rural water management in Uzbekistan as a Fulbright research student. 
She is currently one of only six first generation students funded by the Marshall Scholarship at the University of Oxford's MA program in environmental governance. Frishta is building on her Fulbright research at Oxford by advancing a socio-legal studies lens to transboundary resource governance in Eurasia. Our next speaker is Ruby Flores, who is a participant in the US Student Binational Business Program in Mexico from 2019 to 2020. While in Mexico, she worked for an NGO that sought to strengthen the DE and I culture and policies of corporations and government agencies. After returning to the US in 2020, Ruby joined the board of Fulbright Prism, a volunteer based organization aimed at empowering LGBTQ plus Fulbrighters. In addition, she works for an advocacy organization focused on passing national immigration reform. Next is Maisy Chang, who was a participant of the ETA program in Laos from 2014 to 2015. Maisy identifies as a second generation Hmong American woman with a BA in women's studies from St. Catherine University in St. Paul, Minnesota. Growing up, she heard many stories from her elders and parents about Laos, their homeland, which is what led her to apply to the Fulbright program. Today, she is a learning solutions consultant and leadership development coach who is passionate about helping organizations adopt human-centered ways of working for inclusive and high-performing teams. And finally, we have Dr. Jalicia Jolly. Dr. Jolly was a participant in the U.S. Student Research Program to Jamaica from 2014 to 2015. Dr. Jalicia Jolly is a postdoctoral fellow and incoming assistant professor in American Studies and Black Studies at Amherst College. She researches and teaches on Black women's health, grassroots activism, and reproductive justice. The transnational politics of gender, structural racism, sexuality, class, and health, intersectionality and HIV AIDS in the US and Caribbean, black feminist health science, black motherhood, and birth justice. Her, first, her forthcoming book with University of California Press entitled um, Three Erotics, Black Caribbean Women and Self-Making in the Time of HIV AIDS is an, is an ethnography and oral history of young HIV positive black Jamaican women's reproductive justice organizing. Before passing the mic over to Tan as our moderator, we wish to remind the audience that we are here to honor and celebrate the stories of our panelists. Terms aside, what this panel is asking of our panelists to do is for them to share our, their lives with us. Knowing this, we are asking folks here to reflect with us in the knowledge that our panelists share with us during the panel. If you are a practitioner in the field of international ed, how can you apply what you learned today to your work? If you identify with the experiences of our panelists, how is this conversation supporting you? And how can we go further? Where do we need to go next with this topic? With that said, it is our honor to turn the panel over to Tan to get the conversation started. So let me go ahead. We are now going to feature our panelists. Hey, thanks, Jeremy. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. I'm going to start out with the first question for the entire panel. The term heritage and common usage offer, often refers to tradition, beliefs, rituals, and culture that are part of a particular group or nation state's identity. It refers to something inherited and anchored in the past. Does heritage seeking or heritage connected resonate with you as a way of describing your experience? And what does this term or concept mean to you? I'm happy to just kick us off here. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm Maisie. Did my Fulbright uh, in Laos, as Jeremy and Kelly mentioned. Um, for me, the term heritage seeking or heritage uh, connected certainly resonates with me. I would say if I was asked to choose one, I would more so say that um, I chose to do my Fulbright experience because I was seeking. So I more, the term heritage seeking more so resonates with me. I um, identify as a second generation Hmong American and for those of you who have heard about, who are hearing about Hmong people for the first time on this panel, uh, just to give you a really quick summary, they're an ethnic minority group that um, is originally from China, southern parts of China, but they migrated to the northern parts of Laos, Vietnam, and Thailand, and um, around the 19th, search, 19th century, I believe. And so um, my grandparents are from Laos, and um, just growing up, hearing stories about how they were involved, the Hmong people were recruited to be a part of the Vietnam War conflict through the CIA's secretive operations and how that essentially led um, 
you know, my family to leave because of the conflict there. And um, in 1975, when the United States pulled out, you know, South Vietnam, and it basically just caused a huge influx of Hmong people leaving um, for for safety, essentially. So my parents and my grandparents were political refugees to the United States. I just really kind of felt like there was a gap in my understanding of who I am because there was so much pain and trauma that they experienced. And so when they got to the United States, it was just like a reset for them. They're just like, we just wanna focus on the good stuff now. And I struggled personally to really reconcile my identity as someone who was Hmong and American. So that bicultural aspect of my identity is something that I appreciated, but I felt like I really needed to explore that for myself. And so that's why um, heritage seeking is a term that really resonates with me is because I really feel like it's a way for a grantee to um, seek or like return to a place where they have ancestors ties to further just explore that piece on their own for themselves. Yeah, I'm happy to share um, following my seat. Um, my story is a bit different. I was born in Mexico City. I lived there until I was 10. And I subsequently moved to South Texas, which is very, um, the culture there is very Mexican centered. And so for me, I never felt like I was seeking to return to my culture. I very much felt like I was still in a culture. And so I think that's a bit of the framing that has to happen for different stories of students that seek to return to their quote unquote country. Um, and the fact that for me, it was simply like going from Texas to California or going to another state in the United States that both countries are part of me and I experience both in, in a similar way, but I think it does stand to, to sort of name that and that there are many differences in how we experience this um, different, I guess, identity. Absolutely, I just wanna echo um, both of kind of what was shared and uh, thank you for the space. It's a pleasure to be here and, and I really appreciate the push to really think about um, uh, cultural heritage and equity and inclusion within the space and context of the Fulbright in the US State Department. So this is really meaningful and I appreciate this conversation. Um, the term really resonates with me. I'm a Jamaican American and as um, was shared, I did the Fulbright in Jamaica 2014, 2015. Um, and I consider myself a Jamaican American. According to the scholarship on Caribbean immigration, I'm considered a 1.5 generation um, immigrant, which uh, which refers to people who immigrate to a new country before during early their early teens. And um, I was born in Jamaica and I grew up in the United States. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, a transnational, um, New York City as a transnational city um, meant that I was constantly around sort of you know, multiple different cultures, but especially aspects of the Caribbean were really, you know, sort of um, were omnipresent and were an integral part of my life. Um, and so um, I think her heritage connector really, you know, resonates more so than seeker because um, much of that was sort of inculcated in how I was socialized and in and, and the neighborhoods I navigated and the food I ate and the kind of connections that were developed, right? Um, and um, Anglophone Caribbean, the Francophone Caribbean, the, the um, uh, Hispanophone Caribbean, just kind of this sort of different mixture of cultures, of, of race, of ethnicity, of, of, um, of um, uh, multiple different kinds of connections and ways of being in the world. And so um, I grew up with a transnational frame of really understanding the world that was grounded in my experience as a Black immigrant, as a daughter of the African diaspora, based in a home that was away from home. Um, and so the Fulbright really offered this opportunity to really think about this on a broader um, institutional and, and, and national, but also cross-national and, and really transnational level that really moves beyond national boundaries. And so, yeah, that, that term really certainly um, resonates. Yeah, I would say that I also identify as heritage connected. And I think that my heritage played a very strong role in why I decided to do research in Uzbekistan. I was a researcher when I was on my flow by grant and I still am a researcher. I'm doing research here. And my work looks at natural resource sharing and I'm doing a lot of ethnographic work. So to be able to do research, I have to be able to talk to people, to interact with people, to understand people, to read and write. 
I'm a native speaker of Persian and Uzbekistan is part of the Persian speaking belt. So naturally I felt the most natural and the most comfortable doing a sort of socio-legal studies, ethnographic work, somewhere where I speak the language and where I also speak a bit of Uzbek and Russian, which is uh, also through my heritage. And I would have to add that heritage isn't only about inheriting a language or a culture or even physical features. It's also a belief system. My heritage and my family history is a history of war induced migration. I am a woman of color. So I grapple with structural discrimination everywhere I go uh, because of how I look and my experiences in the States, um, in Central Asia, and especially here at Oxford University, which is the epitome of power and hierarchy and social class. So all these experiences give me this appreciation for equity and also this drive for um, achieving some sort of democracy or racial, ethnic injustice, women's rights. I guess that I naturally became a researcher because I feel like research is my way of making this happen. I like love all your stories so much. Thank you for sharing um, that with us. Um, I wanna first ask Jalisha a question. I really love your research, by the way. I did my thesis on um, women's health, just specifically women's pain and doctors refusing to acknowledge women's pain. So learning about your research and your work with like, um, feminism is something I find really interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, for this discussion, we want to carry an intersectional lens throughout the conversation. And for us, um, what for you is the most important, is the importance of intersectionality in discussing issues related to holding heritage or connection in the place you did your Fulbright? And for this conversation around supporting heritage connected Fulbrighters? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for sharing that question. And yes, I agree. The stories are so robust and just wonderful. And it's, it's a pleasure to be able to, an honor to be able to listen to them. Thank you for sharing. Um, so intersectionality is a key part of, I would say, sort of my personal and scholarly entrance into Fulbright, into the work. And so um, I work on racial, gender, and sexual dimensions of HIV AIDS among young Black women. And before the Fulbright, I actually did some preliminary analysis in Brooklyn, in the community that I'm from, in Uganda, and in Kampala, Uganda. And, um, and noticed really connections in the lived experiences and government responses and in structural inequalities in ways that really shaped the way marginalization and histories of oppression mapped onto bodies, right? It really shaped health outcomes and it really shaped who has access to the basic resources and opportunities to live and, and who um, is exposed to those, those experiences that really facilitate death um, and, and, and suffering. And so, I had these two sort of comparative spaces and I really wanted to see how, um, how this unfolded in the context of where I was from, um, in the context of the Caribbean. And as someone who was studying HIV AIDS, um, you know, I really wanted to really unpack these racial, sexist and classist constructions of disease, many of which we're seeing, you know, we've seen unfold in the last two years as, as we were managing um, another, yet another pandemic, right? And we know that the sort of inequalities that made way for HIV AIDS to have these disproportionate impacts on marginalized communities and countries um, that were largely underfunded because of histories of inequality and, um, and, um, and, and political economic divides were also the sort of pre-existing inequalities that paved the way for COVID. But I digress. Um, I really love talking about pandemics and, pol and politics and inequality. So I'm also an ethnographer. And so that meant that I was in the spaces really immersive in the local context, um, spending time with people, building relationships, building rapport, understanding myself in this space, how I shaped the dynamics, how I shaped the, you know, the sort of ways um, people responded to the work, to the idea of Fulbright, to those questions around e economic inequality, um, class divides, HIV, illness, poverty, right? So I was asking really fundamental questions as a black woman, Jamaican American in, in the space of Jamaica. So intersectionality was important for me, um, not just sort of as a theoretical scholarly lens that was abstract for me, but as something that was fundamental, fundamentally personal to how I moved in the space, how I navigated it, right? And so I was thinking about it from a research context, but also definitely from a personal context, right? And even though I sort of had these identity markers that one would assume would easily create a sense of belonging, right? As a um, black woman, as a um, you know sort of person of Jamaican heritage descent, um, uh, 
as as an immigrant, um, I also was uh, a I was also a university student, right? I was also a U.S. citizenship carrying person. I was also someone that was associated with the U.S. State Department, and um, according to the sort of as we know from the historical legacies of um, of the U.S. and the Caribbean, we know that and and. I would say broadly, globally, we know that that comes with a certain level of not just cultural baggage, but institutional baggage. Um, and so that doesn't always mean diplomacy in the context that I navigate, right? And so in this very important space of a cultural, a flagship cultural exchange program, I had to navigate what it meant to, um, to be a young woman navigating the streets, navigating institutional spaces, doing this really important work that I hope will shed light on and elevate the health, the experiences, the organizing, the activism, and the, the, the sort of political aspirations of an important um, population that was often excluded in medical journals, in academic scholarship, in public health interventions, and deprioritized in funding in a, on a global context, right, um, in international agencies, to really I had to do all of that kind of work, but also really bring it home to the everyday life of, of what it meant to, to deal with my own identity as someone coming back into a space, learning about the work, but also learning about my family history and context my, um, and, and really trying to reckon that with what it was like to be, um, my family's from a working class, working poor community, fishing village, Raytown in Kingston, in the city, Kingston, Jamaica, um, what it meant to really reckon with that experience, that, that real time sort of um, aspect of the everyday lived realities of many working poor um, Black Jamaicans with the sort of privileges and the historical baggage that comes with um, just inherently with um, what it means to do a Fulbright. And so the, the, the clash of that um, facilitated access, the clash of that also really required um, an opening and a confrontation and a reckoning that um, that was racial, that was cultural, that was class, that was gendered, and that was incredibly important to my ability to be able to do this work and, and to do it in a way that was effective, but also respectful um, and honor the experiences and lives as well as my, my own. I, I, I mean, that was such, yeah, that was, that was such an interesting experience. I feel like a lot of our panelists also have very um, similar experience of, you know, identity and issues of identity when moving from away from a U.S. context to another um, place and sort of reconciling with that. And so I kind of want to open this question up to my seat, but also we want to open up to other panelists as well if you want to answer this question. Like, what led you to apply for the Fulbright? Because that is a very, I mean, for me at first it was a bit contentious to apply for the Fulbright. I didn't know um, what that meant as an API person abroad and whether or not I wanted to support a program like the Fulbright and how did you learn about it? I know I personally did not learn about the Fulbright. I know my C, you said you did not learn about it to like, you know, the last hour essentially. And that was the same for me. Like um, the summer of my senior year was when I found out. So that is the last 11th hour <laughs> when you find out. So, um, and were there reasons you chose your particular institutions? I know there are reasons that some of us chose the country you went to, but there, was there a specific reason you chose the institutions um, or the country? I mean, and how if at all did your did that relate to your heritage connection to the place you studied? Yeah, I, I definitely, um have a lot to say too, like Jalisha, I, I can, you know, what you were sharing just previously about navigating the complexity of identities, being an insider outsider, I have a whole thing I could go down, you know, about that, but to just really answer your question, Tan, about why, you know, why a Fulbright and how I learned about it. Um, I do identify as a first generation um, college, you know, graduate. So um, for me, I didn't really learn about it until probably my, my junior year, <laughs> my third year. So I was going through that process of like thinking about what comes after graduation. And I knew personally that I did not want the traditional like nine to five. I was not ready, you know, to go into that. I knew that I was really interested in like international development, economic development and education. I was doing some research already through um, some of the fellowship opportunities at my alma mater where I was already exploring um, access to education and the role that education played in social so economic mobility as well as just identity development and um, 
I knew that I really wanted to go to Laos to further explore that because of the heritage connection I had, but something that I just grew up hearing all the time from the women in my lives, um, my mom, my aunts, you know, a lot of them, they spoke a lot about how women, Hmong women in particular, did not have access to education because traditionally they were really expected to stay home, do the caretaking, and it was often their brothers who were sent to school. And so that was something that was so important to me, and it was a big motivator as to why I pursued education and higher education for myself. And so I knew that there was more that I wanted to explore there, not just to understand the political history of Laos, but also wanting to see what was the lived experiences of Hmong Lao women myself. Like I wanted to just explore that for myself knowing that I wanted to go back and I didn't want the nine to five, I was having some issues or some, I was accessing, I was getting um, meeting challenges, right? In terms of what would that look like, right? I didn't have money <laughs> to go by myself. And so I had met with a mentor of mine and she happened to do a Fulbright research grant in Thailand. And she was also a heritage um, seeker herself, heritage connected student herself. So she introduced me to Fulbright and that's when I was like, oh my gosh, this is the vehicle. You know, I it would give me the structure. It would allow me to be economically supported. And then I would be in a, in a community setting. I think that was the piece that I was the most nervous about was knowing that my family left um, as political refugees. I was really nervous, you know, about going back. We, we've heard stories. I've heard stories about um, Hmong elders or Hmong people who go back and they don't have a good experience. There was, they disappeared, you know, like all those kinds of stories. I was hearing those kinds of stories. And so I knew that my parents would probably not be okay with me going by myself. And I wanted a little bit of that um, sense of you know support and community and protection too and so it seemed like it was the right vehicle um, for me to really do that and I think further too I wanted to really make an impact I didn't want to just make it like a it wasn't just about traveling to a new place I really wanted to be in a community where I could really make an impact so those were all the motivating factors for me in terms of why um I chose to do a Fulbright and I, I decided, you know, to pursue it. And um, then, you know, the next debate was like research or, you know, teaching, like research or teaching, right? I bounced back and forth, you know, on, on that too. But ultimately, I decided that I wanted to really be at a university setting and teach English because I knew that just um, in terms of my preparation, I did a lot of information and inf informational interviews with scholars who are already researching Southeast Asia. And they warned me a little bit about some of the barriers that you encounter when you are researching researcher in Laos in the context of Laos because of the just some of the restrictions that you have to navigate and I was like oh yeah I don't want to meet those kinds of barriers and so it makes if I'm just really seeking to understand and make an impact I felt that the ETA program was the best one for me. So if I can jump into this question a little bit as well, Tan, um, and I think for me that the answer of where I chose and why I chose the program actually relates to the previous question about intersectionality. Um, I very purpose purposefully chose the program that I did, the binational business program, because it would place me in Mexico City. Being in an urban area was really important to me as an LGBTQ person and already experiencing what it is, what it what it is to me. What does it mean to be this identity in Mexico? I knew that I, for my safety, I needed to be in a place that was more open and more accepting than a lot of rural Mexico. And I think it connects to the way that I even thought of doing a Fulbright, right? I think, Delicia, you were talking about sort of bringing in the intersectional lens from the US to here. I mean, as you were mentioning the HIV crisis, it started with letting this entire group of people that was very clearly dying continue to die in this country in the 80s. And yet, how can we expect another country that a lot of times takes its cues from the United States um, to sort of be as more progressive? So I think for me, I think that always plays into it. And I know that a lot of people that are heritage seeking or even are not have this concern of how will I survive? How will I be safe? Um, and so I think that there's absolutely no shame in being uh, intentional and in where you can be placed um, in order to, to be able to do this experience. Yeah, I really sort of um, resonate with sort of the conflicts that people can have when you're like applying and figuring out um, where you wanna go and um, how you will be seen at the places that you are in, how, how you are seen in the spaces that you occupy outside the US context. 
And I kind of want to open the floor to Frisha and ask like, you know, in the early months of the grant, when you finally do arrive in these countries, what was it like navigating your identity as a heritage connected grantee when you finally do make it there? And also thinking about the other identities that make you who you are. If you have a story that you would like to share, we would love to hear it. And I also want to open this question up to the entire floor as well. Um, I would also love to hear your experience when you finally get there. Um, what was it like? Yeah, it was pretty nerve wracking. And I did my a grant during the height of the COVID pandemic. So my first three weeks of my grant, I was quite literally quarantined in a hotel. So I got three weeks of just to myself where I just had these thoughts of nervousness and anxiety. So I got a lot of time to think about this. Um, but overall, I was very nervous and a lot of it had to do with my host country's political situation. I was a bit privileged that I've lived in the area before. I lived in Kyrgyzstan, I've been to Uzbekistan, so I was very familiar with a lot of the sensitivities. And I was very um, nervous on like, why did I choose to come as a researcher knowing that I'm going to have all these political challenges? So this is my biggest anxiety. Um, for those of you who don't know, Uzbekistan is still very much an authoritarian country to this day. And it has a history of very fraught ethnic politics. Um, there are many different ethnic groups, but Uzbekistan is a nation state. It's named land of the Uzbeks. So according to the government, the other ethnic groups don't really exist or aren't prominent or aren't important enough. And here I am as a researcher interested in inclusivity and interested in social minorities. And I myself have heritage both with um, the uh, primarily dominant Uzbeks, but also with a secondary ethnic group called um, the Tajiks. So I was very um, scared of how to like, uh, how to confide my identity. I didn't know if I should say to the other cohort members, if I should confide this even in with the US embassy and local um, locals that work for the US embassy. Um, I just had no idea how to navigate this as well because it was such a big part of my identity, but also my research. And I knew I could get in a lot of political trouble. So this was a very big anxiety. And as I was going through all these thoughts, it was really isolating to be around my cohort because they didn't have these um, worries at all. Um, Uzbekistan for them was something very new and cool. Uh, they were having this culture shock, which I wasn't going through. So of course I was very isolating. And on top of that, I noticed that because of the way I look and because I passed local to a bit, I was being treated very differently. Um, my locals who had come to the other cohort members would treat my more white American cohort members as cool and new, engage in conversations with them versus um, kind of glossing over me. I kind of felt like my experiences or, uh, weren't important, that I wasn't an American, that I wasn't a full writer. And every now and then I would be treated more as a translator or as an encyclopedia, as someone to explain to the white kids what's going on or why this happens, why this doesn't happen. Um, so it did contribute to all this isolation, um, but it did get better as I went on. And I think a lot of it was self-maturity. I found out that there are genuine friendships out there and I found locals that I could confide all my anxieties in who kind of helped me navigate the political situation and reassured me that I can like be confident over my ethnic identity, even amidst all the political tension. Um, so Fulbright really showed me that I can seek out these types of people and um, these genuine friendships that I created, it wasn't just research-based, but these are lifelong friendships. Uh, and um, I remember very vividly that during my Fulbright orientation, we were told that we would likely not be able to become friends with local women because local women are very family oriented. They go home, they don't talk to foreigners, which is completely different because of my identity, because I spoke their language, I was able to breach in into these perceived hard to reach areas and create these friendships. And I'm really glad that all of these more negative aspects that I thought would be a really pervasive weren't as an issue as well. And my identity really helped me be able to um, get into these places and create these connections. Yeah, I, Sashda, I think what you were just saying really struck a chord with me as well, because I, I experienced a lot of anxiety in the beginning as well, just knowing that, um, you know, my parents were political refugees. My father told me 
I'm on the blacklist in Laos. Don't talk about me. Don't bring up my name. <laughs> he was a part of the, he was a soldier, you know, who participated in the CIA operations. And so um, I felt like my anxiety was really driven by the, my parents' reaction to me doing a for Biden in Laos. My mom told me a horror story a day to try to deter me from doing my Fulbright in Laos. And this is like after I already accepted the fellowship and had already bought my plane ticket. I literally waited a month before I was going to go to tell my parents because I knew that they would be so nervous, you know, about me going. And so I felt like some of the things that they told me contributed to that anxiety that it was feeling, but I also felt isolated myself too, Frishta, as you, you know, kind of mentioned, um, this dynamic of always having to kind of navigate two worlds, like code switching, that was something that I already kind of knew to do, but this was a whole different context for me, um, in a sense. And I, kind of coined the term, um, the cultural clutch, you know, with my cohort. So I was in a very small cohort. Um, the program was still quite new in Laos. The ETA program was just about a few years in the making. And so I was placed with four other white Americans. And so we, um, always did things together. And I found myself being the person who had to go figure out how we're going to do our laundry, you know, how are we going to like figure out our living situation? And I remember feeling very frustrated with that situation just because I look like the Lao person in the room. I The Lao people always reached out to me or talked to me first. So there was kind of like this, um, I guess, invisible or silent expectation that, oh, my is just going to figure it out for us, right? And that's a, a reflection of their privilege, you know, that they don't have to really engage with the community or figure some of these things out. And so I had to have a real conversation with them about a month into our Fulbright experience. I had to just put them all in a room and say, hey, I'm feeling frustrated with this. I'm feeling like you're all relying on me to be your cultural clutch, you know, that you're Wikipedia, your translator, and I don't want to do this anymore. So I'm, this is the last time I'm going to figure out laundry for us, <laughs> you know, and like, you all need to figure it out. I need you to step up, you know, and do your part too. And so I think that was one aspect of navigating the Fulbright experience. It was just the tension between the cohort and the not being able to relate to them and then not knowing how to ask for support from them either to like support me because my experience was so different. And then I think the other aspect of me navigating the Fulbright experience and that anxiety um, that I was feeling around my identity was just the inability to really tell the, the university, my colleagues or my students about who I really was. You know, I remember um, a student asked me, hey, are you Lao? You know, and I knew I was like, oh my gosh, I want to tell you that I have a heritage connection, but because I'm so scared of my family being viewed as the people who betrayed Laos because they chose to leave, they chose the American side. And so I was afraid of that rejection or the retaliation that um, maybe they would hate me if they actually knew my family ties. And so I kept my identity a secret for three months into my fellowship. I didn't tell anyone um, about my connection or who, like my connection to the, I just said, no, I'm American. You know, I'm American, I'm American. I never really talked about my identity. And then I remember the day that my students found out that I did have a heritage connection was when I had gone um, to visit some relatives that I had in Laos and we went to Hmong New Year together and we got dressed up in our costumes and then I posted on Facebook and then my students were Facebook friends with me and then they saw the photo. And that Monday when I came back into the classroom, my students were, there was just like buzzing and chatter in the classroom. And um, I walked in and I was like, okay, what's going on? Good morning, how's everyone doing? Why is it so loud? And they're like, you're loud. We we knew it. You're wow. And I was like, no, I'm not. What are you all talking about? And then they took out their phones and they're like, see, you're wearing loud clothing. But to me, I think the cognitive dissonance was like, I, but I'm Hmong, you know, like ethnically I'm Hmong, but why are you saying I'm Lao? I'm American. So it was kind of that cognitive distance of like nationality versus ethnicity. They were all saying I was Lao, but I'm like, no, but I'm American, but I'm Hmong. And so we had to have that conversation. And I was like, tell me why you think I'm Lao, you know? And they're like, oh, because you're wearing this costume, you know? And so um, it led to some really meaningful conversations between me and my students too about ethnicity, because I learned that in Lao, they think of themselves very broadly in nationality and they don't acknowledge ethno ethnicity. So in that part of my identity, I felt so erased by my students, you know? But in further conversation, I realized that they just wanted that connection with me. And then they just wanted me to really acknowledge that, yes, I have parents who are from Laos and therefore that made me Lao, you know? And once I embraced that, 
um, I felt that our dynamics really changed in the classroom because of the, and I think it really speaks to the power of, res, of representation. You know, the moment I was like, okay, fine, like I'll go with it. I am, you know, I, yes, my parents are from Laos, so I am Lao, you know, and then they showed up to my house. They were cleaning my house for me. They were buying me groceries and they were asking me to tutor them in exchange, you know, and I, I, um, I think I look back at it now, you know, to say all that anxiety was natural because of what my parents, you know, kind of told me, but I wish that I would have just embraced it, you know, and like told people <laughs> like who I was a little bit more early on, because that really changed the the dynamics. And I think for me, the biggest takeaway, um, is how sometimes, you know, what, um, you know, the people's expectation, right? People, the separation of people from government, you know, like I had some really strong assumptions about how loud people would react to my identity based on the political context that my, that my parents lived in. The political context that my students live in today is quite different and they embraced me wholeheartedly. They didn't reject me at all. And I think if I could go back and redo it, that would be, you know, one of the lessons I would tell myself is like, you know, just be a little bit more honest about who you are um, earlier so that I could, I really felt like I had a very immersive experience after we had some of those um, real conversations about my my roots and connections to Laos. I think that a thread that's been going on. Oh, Jalisha, do you want to? I'd love to hear what you have to say. Sorry. No, no problem. Um, I, I'm happy to pass the mic to you. And I, I just want to respond to your question about what led me to apply for the Fulbright. Um, and how I learned about the program. So I actually really quickly, um, what led me to apply to Fulbright was because I, I did a Fulbright research and I wanted to do some research um, um, uh, for graduates, for my graduate school uh, trajectory. I knew that I wanted to um, expand my research on HIV and black women in the Caribbean and the US. I knew that I, you know, and thankfully that Fulbright experience is a foundational part of um, the book that will be forthcoming in the next year and a half. And I, so I knew I had this scholarly interest, but personally, I knew that I wanted to spend a more prolonged time there, not just to do research work, but to really ex like learn about my culture, learn about my, his, uh, my family history, and to really build on the knowledge that has always been passed down to me via sort of oral traditions and and um, through stories, but I wanted to really experience that for myself and to develop my, you know, uh, my own experience um, of that, my own relationship to the space that is a home away from another home. Um, and so I was applying to graduate school at the same time I was doing the Fulbright. And before the, there's like, it's known that I went to Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. It's no, the Fulbright is known. Um, it's a very privileged context. So, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, they have a lot of a good history of like winning the grant. And so there's a really strong system set up where folks were like, hey, here's the, um, you know, here's the application. There's like archives of applications. So it was really helpful for me because I didn't know what exactly, you know, what that, what, um, how to navigate that process. And so when I spoke to folks, it was it was a very easily sort of structures of support that facilitated that. And so one thing I would suggest to folks who are interested in applying is certainly, um, you know, certainly uh, ask your, ask people um, who you might know have done the program and, and, and talk further, get to get to know them. So that's how I kind of what led me to apply um, to the program in terms of the other part of the question about, um, sorry, that's what sort of, uh, that's how I learned about the program in terms of the other part of the program that in terms of the reasons why um, I chose Jamaica, why I chose to apply. Um, again, uh, I, wanted to work fi finish like wrap up and 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 um do some research on sort of how to amplify black women's health and live experiences and political work but importantly i also wanted to make a connection across the experience the research work that i had done already and across the experiences throughout the african diaspora right it was important for me also to make an impact in the community that i that i that i was from in in, in this country that um is a home away from home and so i wanted to mention in the work on hiv the black caribbean was an important site um as um as was shared by my co-panelist um about like why hiv aids uh was so sort of had this important resonance particularly because the way mar um, bodies were marginalized and deprioritized and you know um it during the reagan era it took a while before there was a sort of vivid and active and dynamic national response people literally had to put their life and bodies on the line in order to assert that you know we deserve resources in order to address this pandemic that was that was happening in u.s context but also it was heightened and happening in a global context um particularly as a, at a time where um 
uh, where certain groups are being sort of singled out as a sort of source of disease transmission. For example, um, the, Haitians were, in 1985, the Center for Disease Control um, labeled Haitians as one of the four H groups of the risk factors for AIDS, right? The four groups that, if we remember, were homos homosexuals, heroin users, hemophiliacs, and Haitians. And so Haitians were the only national group that was included in this. One, the risk category is problematic. Two, the all, an entire ethnic group being and a national group being incorporated into this risk category is also problematic. And it's building off of historical narratives around the race, race disease and exclusion. And these, these have troubling links that really, as we know, determine who has access to resources and who lives and dies. And so I witnessed, you know, sort of, I witnessed those sort of racial disease um, narratives in a context of New York City when I, you know, went to college and sort of learned the sort of intellectual academic framework to understand how this works, um, I wanted to build on this work. I wanted to go back to the Black Caribbean in order to expand this work. And given my sort of personal connection to Jamaica and um, the diaspora connections I wanted to make, I wanted to do it there. So that's why I chose um, Jamaica in particular and wanting to really unpack this um, and really, sh really show like how, you know, how problematic this was, but also what exactly local organizations and local communities and everyday people in the absence of government resources and myth state neglect and less histories of marginalization was was doing this work to literally sustain their communities and to um and to build um movements and networks to claim access to resources and so that's what brings me to the personal part what i was what made me really excited about during my time at the fulbright was actually the opportunity to do some really on the ground, meaningful, impactful work, right? Um, uh, I There was a grant um, at the US Embassy in Kingston that Phil Byers could have applied for. And I applied for this grant in partnership with local community organizations to do an, um, a sort of uh, an, art, an event called Jam Health, encouraging healthy living and mobilizing communities. And essentially what it was, was a holistic health initiative that stemmed from my desire to really make connections in my interest between gender, sexuality, and health to really thinking about how to implement culturally relevant um, health interventions, public health approaches, right? And it, it arrived, it basically um, res resulted from the research that I was doing with the Fulbright that really was showing these inequities in sexual and reproductive health in under-resourced communities in Kingston. And so that prompted my collaborations with local institutions and community members to develop participatory workshops, peer health education sessions. We brought in services such as sort of um, um, HIV STD testing, diabetes screening, um, uh, pap smear services. Um, and what was a beautiful space for that also was because um, it, it we, I built after sort of connecting with folks and that I knew in from who were Jamaican in the US and and the broader um in Jamaica um and in the Canada um you know folks who were practitioners and who wanted to get back to their communities you know they were able to come back with support from this grant and and offer these services in the community that I was from Raytown the fishing village that my family's from and where I was born and so it was a really a wonderful moment to see this come full circle but also it was a really wonderful moment to really emphasize like the ways inequalities are ripped across bodies right I implemented jam health through the um State Department support, through the, uh, sorry, the embassy support right before and right actually around the time of um, chikungunya, um, chick V was, 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 uh, became a viral disease, right? That transmitted, that transmitted to humans by infected mosquitoes. And these mosquitoes lived and breeded in standing water and in, in around um, yards, communities, public spaces, the homes. Many of these, this breeding often happened when, and the standing water that happened in sort of abandoned spaces in the inner city poor communities often, although Chick V was viral throughout the entire country and in many, a few other countries, right? Many other countries. And so it was a, it, it was a time to also think about, not just use my research with my personal experiences to, of race, gender inequality to really think about, okay, here you have a public health crisis, right? As I'm studying a public health, um, uh, as I'm studying a pandemic on right, HIV AIDS, that is really showing me and bringing to relief, not just me, but you know, leaders, community organizers, government officials, et cetera, the risk goes on, of how inequity in class and race maps along geography and access to resources and health outcomes. And so I wanna pause to say like, 
that's what led me to the Fulbright and being in the Fulbright really like really sort of opened up these these personal and and scholarly um connections in ways that were really sort of unexpected but that really brought to the fore not only why the grant and the fellowship and the experience was important but also why personally what drove me to do this work on a meaningful um on the ground level to to, to develop really to bring to the fore the experiences of those who marginalized communities that were typically excluded and um um, from public health context um, and really bring to them community interventions where they saw themselves, where they saw their needs, where they where their um, experiences were meaningfully addressed. And thank you to the Kingston Embassy, if you're here, um, for that support around that. Um, they, the Bernadette uh, uh, um, and Kimberly, and I can't remember everyone's name, but were, they were a phenomenal team that really supported and facilitated that. And I didn't, that's something I didn't, I didn't expect just because I didn't know what kind of, um, you know, what kind of opportunities and partnerships to build from this um, important uh, opportunity. I really want to sort of um, move towards that train of thought that you were just kind of um, putting out there about community building and building relationships. And for you, it was really, um, it had this wonderful outcome, right? For your research, but I kind of want to open that up to other people as well, because I think we've been sort of touching upon it. Um, I first want to ask Ruby this question and then kind of open up to our other panelists. What role did my minority majority relations play in your experience of connecting with your culture or country of heritage? Because we've been talking a lot about minority majority relations and how that gets complicated when you have more than one identity. And then I also want to talk about, you know, beyond just like that complication, how do you go about building community? How do you go about building relationships? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it also relates back to the conversation we were having about experiences being in country and trying to figure out how do you navigate different identities, especially when they have been marginalized, as Micey was sharing. And for me, the outsized influence that parents and family can have in this psyche that we have, uh, you know, before we even get to the, to the ground, there's, you know, so many expectations and so many pre- honestly trauma, right, that has come, there's a reason why your family's left. And so that all comes to, to, the, to the fore whenever, you know, we have to come into as Americans. And so for me, the sort of racial makeup that's typically in Mexico, of course, there's many, many racial groups in, in Mexico, but the sort of dominant struggle is between still very white, um, white passing, I guess, is the term that in the United States it would seem, people that absolutely look like Europeans in Mexico and there's a sizable population in Mexico City and the mixed population as well as indigenous groups, right? So I am very much mixed, four generations have been mixed, but there is a lot of shame in, in the brown color of one's skin, right? And I think for me, going back to Mexico City meant reconnecting with my grandparents and my cousins and, and everyone. And, and there's actually an, an, a huge stigma that even my family still carries a huge shame for not being white, <laughs> which I think in the American context, it's so easy to say, well, we're not white and it's great and we're proud, but actually <laughs> that's not the case in the way they, ex they have experienced for an entire generation and that they, they continue to experience. So there was a lot of tension for me personally and my family ties and also how do I come into a space that as was mentioned, I would work in diversity and inclusion with large multinational companies, which meant very wealthy people in very wealthy spaces, which automatically translated to whiteness. And so how did I insert myself and feel confident in these spaces that didn't necessarily target me, but also wasn't visibly welcoming, right? So I think that's just one of the, the things that in my experience. And the last piece that I wanted to say this part, I think, was touched about by Micey and, and Frischta as well. This, this part that there's many, you, you're coming from part of this culture, but at the same time, people do not see you as Americans, right? So they treat you differently. And I think that's a real struggle. But what I actually ended up pushing myself on was, do I want to be seen as white so that I have the privilege of being a white American in this country, as opposed to being just one of the masses? And that, that relationship and that struggle internally, I think is gonna come up for anyone that does a full and is part of that culture because yeah, you will blend in and maybe we should want to blend in. And there's, there's a fact, of course, not the negative aspects and being placed with an oversized burden to carry the group, but also to me thinking critically, like why do I wanna be seen like the, the other white men in the group or white women? 
maybe I shouldn't. And that's, that's also okay. I'll just add a little bit um, here to already what Ruby has talked about. I think in terms of building community, um, because of the multiplicity of identities that we have, and Ruby, something you were talking about is, um, you know, the way you, you you physically look and the access that you have, right? I think for me, something um, that I did not really embrace before was my association as to America and being an American citizen. Like that was an aspect of my identity that I was not very cognizant of. And through the Fulbright experience was able to really understand the privileges that I had as an American, you know, and that was really uncomfortable for me to like try to talk to my family members, but they kind of put me on a pedestal because I'm from America. But I was trying to explain to them that like, yes, I'm from America, but my family was still poor, you know, like in America, we, I grew up on welfare, like we had wigs, you know, like all these things and like, yeah, but you're not poor in the sense that we're poor here. Right. And so that was kind of the the uncomfortable feelings I had going back to Laos and reconnecting with my parents, um, their relatives who lived there, there was kind of that dynamic going on. And I think further, um, I noticed that because of my, the multiple participating in my identity, I was able to navigate different spaces. So um, being able to be in the expat bubble, you know, and meet other European expats like from the west too I was like oh this is such a different dynamic like if I was at home in the United States I would not really hang around these people at all you know because I just yeah that would just not be something I would be able to access because here there's so few of us in town we just became a group and so I felt that the way I was trying to build community and the way I was seeing um, my role in building community was to be a bridge, you know, to be a bridge builder, to weave, you know, paths between different circles. And so um, one of the things that I decided to do with my cohort, um, the other ETs that, you know, we were all living together in that scenario. And I said, you know, it's really meaningful. It would be really meaningful to me to host a Thanksgiving dinner. And let's invite our expat friends and our university colleagues, as well as some of our Lao students together so we can all have a meal, share this American tradition together but just really do some of that bridging you know between them and I remember there was one particular conversation I witnessed that was very powerful so it was um, a Lao faculty with a German um, doctor and so he was from German Germany and doing research about snake bites um, and then that faculty member she was teaching English and so I remember witnessing the conversation and she's like hey what's your name and he's like oh yeah I'm doctor so and so I'm from Germany she's like really you're a doctor I always see you out at seven drinking beer all the time. I didn't know you were a doctor here. I just thought you're an expat traveling. And he's like, no, I'm a doctor. I research stuff here, you know? And so it was such a wonderful thing, you know, just to like see and witness that, oh, you know, we all live in our bubbles, you know, every day, right? And um, I think this is the value of being a heritage connected Fulbrighter is because we think differently. We see building those relationships a little differently. We can push the envelope a little bit. And that was such a meaningful moment for me to facilitate, to be like, you two haven't met. Why don't you sit down, grab some like food, you know, get to know each other, you know? And then it was just like such a powerful conversation to hear them, you know, um, interact, you know, in that dynamic and then uh, understand what their work is, you know, actually. So um, I can pass the mic forward too. I have more stories to tell, but I don't want to <laughs> hog the mic. So feel free to jump in for the other folks. Alicia, do you have something to say? Um, I know your mic is on. Okay. Um, if uh, I can just quickly um, sort of like pivot this conversation just a little bit. Um, I know that we talked about the U.S. and the U.S. relations to our heritage-seeking countries a lot. And so I kind of want to uh, start this question out with Frisha and then sort of open it up to everyone else as well. Like what happens when we as a program and as a field of international education avoid a conversation on the experiences of her heritage connected grantees? Because I think we've touched upon it that this experience is quite different from our white counterparts, right? Because I know that um, as uh, Macy, you kind of mentioned, they have a totally different experience. They're like, I'm having so much fun. This is sort of like a vacation for me. I'm just visiting. And then for you, you're like, I'm trying to form a whole relationship. So um, what are sort of um, the consequences of just not talking about this issue? Yeah, I think in my case, it made me feel like a defunct American 
because a lot of the advice on how to integrate into my host country did not apply to me. I was um, navigating all sorts of political sensitivities, cultural, economic, social. And to be frank, um, to this day, after my Fulbright experience, I continue to doubt my Americanness. Like my, as a result of my Fulbright, I don't, uh, my Americanness level has just dramatically changed. Um, I'm right now I'm living in the UK, so I'm, so I'm away from the US and this continues to amplify day by day as I'm away from the US. Um, like I feel like I'm an American on paper, but all the rights and privileges that I thought I had before my full right doesn't actually exist. Because on the full right, I saw those hierarchies. I saw how like looking different, how racial injustice materializes. And it was such a profound experience to be living in this host country, to be part of the US embassy, but to just be treated so differently by embassy staff, by locals, by my own cohort members who were similar in age, but um, definitely were treating me very differently. And as I said before, um, integration was really diff difficult. I felt really ostracized from other Americans. And um, I also felt like I was a disappointment to my host country because they seemed to sign up for this exchange with an American. And they had this idea that the stereotypical American would come in and introduce something new. But instead, they got someone that looks like them, that acts like them, that has a similar name. So it almost seemed like they were got the short end of the bargain. And I visually could see how they would react very differently to my other Fulbright cohort members and to myself. And this psychologically really affected me seeing how um, I seemed like I was a disappointment to the country. But despite like all this psychological pressure, like I felt like I built a home in my host country because I was so isolated. It almost felt like out of necessity, I had to build relations and figure things out. And I found all these genuine friendships. Um, but overall, to summarize, um, it did really affect my Americanness. And I'm still trying to figure out where I stand on my identity. Okay, I um just sort of um harping on that, and I kind of want to also ask like, what kind of research you would like to see regarding experience of heritage seeking individuals in higher education? Because I know that um this panel is really dedicated to sort of addressing some of the issues that uh, are coming forth, but then um moving forward, what kind of um just academic or even like maybe not academic, as I know I'm kind of sick of reading academic papers, but just accessible material that would really help, you know, individuals in this like on this panel, just navigate all those difficulties of like um, feeling like an insider, insider outsider all the time and constantly having to do that e even in an even different space. Um, we could start with Ruby, but then expand it to other people. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't have a definitive answer. I don't have a specific thing that I think I know I must be researching and we actually be help this, this specific group. But I just think that exploring what the different demographics of the groups are, I think the connection, how far away it is, is actually really important in, in shaping that 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 interaction with, with the culture. So whether it's your own experience of living in the country before, whether it's a generation previous or many generations before, and how that intersects with a person's class coming into the country, I think that's huge. And the minority and the racial makeup of, of who your identity is versus going to the country, right? Um, and I think something that Frishta talked about, and I think is really good to, would be good to get some research and also for commissions and posts. And I feel, no, we, we have a question about that and we can delve more into it later. But what does it look like for especially in an ETA context or in a context where there's a, the grantee sharing with a group, what does it look like to actually prep that group and say, actually, this program is not of white Americans. Americans look many different ways and prepping them. And this is not just for heritage connected students, but for all identities, right? Whether it's um, different racial minorities in the States or other minorities in general, what does it look like for that to be the, the picture of America, a, a picture that's actually not white, and soon to be not a minor, uh, white majority country. 
Um, and maybe that would change the experiences of, of many of us, but also of, of their expectations. Yeah, um, and so I also want to sort of like, like open it up to, I guess, our final question as well, just because um, I know when I was abroad, um, I had this anxiety about one of my co my the past ETA that I was replacing. Um, that person seemed like very all American, and I'm like, I am not all American. I don't celebrate Thanksgiving. What are they going to think of me? And my students asked me a lot of questions that I felt I couldn't answer. Um, and uh, and like Lotus in part got started because of the next question, which asks you like, how can Fulbright commissions and posts better support participants? And this is for everyone um, who identify as heritage seeking in their programs, but just beyond heritage seeking, how can you just support people who are not your traditional white applicants? I'm happy to kick off because um, I'm going to really answer this question more from a recruitment lens, <laughs> if I can. Um, that's an area for me personally that I feel really passionate about since I've returned from doing a Fulbright. I already shared on this panel that I didn't learn about Fulbright right in the beginning. I didn't learn about it until much later in my um, academic you know, experience. And so I, I would really like to see um, you know, the Fulbright Commission partner more intentionally with IIE you know, and um, other Fulbright program advisors out there to do some programming you know, to really talk about um, Fulbright because I feel like imposter syndrome is still so real, you know, despite the world, the digital world that we live in, despite so many DI initiatives within the higher education space, I still find that when I'm, um, and I participate, I actively recruit, you know, in my region. So I do a lot of things to try to bridge that gap there in terms of just, you know, the number of applicants who may identify as first generation, you know, BIPOC prepared, like I am really passionate about that year. So so I'd like to see, um, you know, Fulbright do a little bit more intentional uh, messaging or um, programming around that aspects just to really ensure that people who are marginalized don't discount themselves, right? When we think about Fulbright, we traditionally think of the Ivy Leagues, right? There's a perception around Fulbright, right? And if you don't um, grow up in a family or in a social circle where you're exposed to that, you immediately discount yourself, you know, from that experience. It seems very unattainable, you know, and I know that um, through my previous experience of being a Fulbright program advisor myself, that's just like 80% of the process is convincing a student to apply <laughs> from what I've seen, you know, so I feel very, very passionate that there has to be more intentionality behind recruiting efforts. And then I think the second aspect is something we've all really shared already on this panel about our isolation and the struggles of having to navigate our Fulbright experiences ourselves. I'd like to see the Fulbright Commission staff, um, or just the staff in general. I know that not every every Fulbright um, country has a commission. I didn't. Laos is a smaller has a smaller program, so we didn't have a dedicated staff in commission. And I think one of the things that I really saw, um, you know, that we didn't have there because there wasn't a commission is just um, emotional support, you know, or, or people the intentionality around holding space to process. You know, it was pretty much like we got there, we were all sent off, and then we just had to figure it out, you know, on our own. So whether you have a commission site or not, I just think that there's a lot of value in having dialogues and intentionally thinking about the support process and for ETAs especially I know for research it's a little differently you get to choose where you go but for ETAs there's a placement process and previously I was not we were not allowed to give feedback you know around that piece I had a vision for myself doing my Fulbright I wanted to intentionally be within a community but I had no say in the placement process I was placed where I was most further from the Hmong community I called the I had the public affairs officer out and I batted for myself and I advocated for myself. And he said, nope, sorry, there's nothing you can't do about it. I make all the decisions based on your application and based on what you wrote in your application, I know you'll be a good figure. And I was like, no, that's not what I want. You know, so we had this whole, um, you know, I would say we had a whole process, you know, to just, I, I pursued that process and I gave feedback. And um, luckily, you know, I couldn't impact the process for mine, for my time. But after that, I know that the process changed because I advocated, you know, for myself or for someone who would be in my shoes. Um, and so there's a lot of room, I think, to explore there. And I don't have definite answers, but I just think that it really starts with some intentionality and conversation. 
And I just wanted to add that one factor that we should look at is also economic diversity, like socioeconomic level, because a Fulbright also is you getting a monthly stipend every year, every uh, month, and being responsible for covering your living costs, for health, for um, personal. And that's a really big responsibility, especially if you're coming straight out of um, undergrad, if you're um, early in your career and especially in a foreign country. So there should be education for those who need it, some sort of financial literacy on how you're gonna fund yourself, how you're gonna feed yourself, how you're gonna make sure you have everything that you need. Yeah, if I can add really quickly, I think some of the things that were already mentioned are, are the things that come to my mind as well. I think simply acknowledging that these realities exist during commissions, I think would be really helpful. We have a lot of different programming during the commission uh, orientations and all the rest of it, but I think some of this stands to to take at least you know a good twenty minutes. I think it's not too much to ask. There's also a piece of community building and even mentorship, where and this involves many different parts of the huge structure that is Fulbright. But I think alumni program does have a place to 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 do here, where there is a huge knowledge and support that an alumni of a similar identity can bring to, to the table, especially when the applicant is really young or the participant is really young, that I think would be incredible. And lastly, I just want to reiterate exactly what Maisie said in, in, the, in the placement process. And this is, I think, not an easy fight and something that has to be taken up in really some of the higher decision-making aspects of, of the Fulbright program itself. But this is also something that um, really affects LGBT participants. And like I mentioned, for me, it was the main driving force of wanting to be in Mexico City. And if I didn't have the option to be in Mexico City, I would not have done it because I would not have felt safe. And this is not the option that a lot of people have. And I think it's actually a huge detriment and a huge barrier for many people with marginalized identities. So this is something that I think it's worth exploring. Um, and of course, the input of many different identities can actually play into that. So. And absolutely, much of what was shared resonates with me. Um, and I totally agree, more intentionality around recruitment, expanding it beyond elitist institutions or certain economic, socioeconomic income brackets. And I totally also, in addition to expanding the conception of, you know, what makes what makes this attainable absolutely financial literacy and i would say even moving beyond that increase the stipend so that people can fund and feed themselves um without worrying right so i think social economic diversity more than <laughs> increased stipend as we're thinking about recruitment and also like what um we can attract i think we also have to be mindful that um i understand that you know there are obvious reasons to kind of um to having like the stipend align with like what's kind of the rate locally, especially um, given kind of, you know, equity concerns. And, and I also think if we're recruiting heritage um, seeker speakers and connectors, a lot of the time, first generation students like myself at the time had to take care of other family members, right, um, and back home. And so in, in multiple homes away from home. So I think what that meant was having, you know, having a reduced stipend also kind of made that difficult, right? I was just wasn't only taking care of myself. So I think increase the stipend. Um, in addition, I think it's important to have these conversations locally and to hold space to process. Um, and that space can look like not just sort of like an intro, like, here's what the Fulbright is, here's the security concerns, here are the neighborhoods you should not go as an American. I think we should also have a conversation about, well, here's a little bit about the historical context of the space. Here's a bit about, you know, kind of um, not just events that are happening, but like, let us introduce you to the representative, let us introduce you to, to the space. I think there was a lot of gatekeeping with the embassy space and it, that was a little strange just to name it. I think having, having um, more access, not just to the space, but also to kind of like what, um, to kind of, um, you know, resources, opportunities, and that might mean expanding different kinds of resources. But it was really unclear to a lot of folks in my cohort um, about what exactly the, you know, what, what exactly the, the, the site could serve as is for us, right? It kind of was just like, here's the briefing, here's the intro, gone. So just like having those structures of support more legible and upfront from the beginning, I think could be a great recruitment advertising point. Um, and I also just wanted to stress the importance of the cohort um, 
Um, I, I was really lucky. I had a really wonderful sort of intergenerational cohort that where we shared experiences, events, we connected and it was just a wonderful great to sort wonderful way to process the experience together. We were also just four. Um, and and today I still keep in touch um, with most of them, not all. It was <laughs> the other with two of, of the three um, um, that made the four of us. And so I think j just kind of also finding ways to have like maybe intentional community building events with the cohorts and more of those that that could be helpful um but but yeah that those are some ideas and i just want to echo everything that was uh shared by my participants around access equity safety um, um protection and um and uh uh expanding it thank you thank you everyone for sharing your I mean, honestly, I love all this feedback. These are feedback I had on my grand period. I was like, why, is, why can't I afford to live here? Um, I'm, I, was, I also had to convince my family um, that I wasn't making a mistake when I told them what I was getting paid right out of college. They're like, you're getting paid that much to do a prestigious fellowship? Okay, like that doesn't seem real. So um, if anyone works for the Fulbright other than Kelly and Jeremy are on the panel, um, please write this down. <laughs> um, I'm gonna turn this back to Kelly and Jeremy um, so that we can sort of get questions from the audience. So um, Kelly, Jeremy, why don't you take us off? Hi everyone. Um, I just wanna say that the, the amount of collective knowledge that's being shared here is really astounding and so invaluable um, for all of us who are listening. And just amazing how this, this issue of, of heritage, however we want to define it, really is so by its nature intersectional, but also really gets to the heart of the positioning of the Fulbright program as this program that represents the United States, right? Um, and I think that's really come out beautifully from all of your work and your discussion today. Um, we do have just a couple of questions. Uh, we had one question about what uh, commissions and posts can do, but I think you all addressed that really well. Um, we had another question. Um, this is from Ashkali. It says, hi panelists, thanks so much for sharing your stories today. I was curious, being a heritage connected grantee can be a double edged sword. Did you ever feel during your grant that you were treated differently or considered not American enough as compared to white grantees in your host country? Um, for example, I've heard this happening to some Indian American grantees in India, so that's why I ask. I know some of you have touched on this, but if anyone wanted to add anything about their experiences, please go ahead. Um, I, I personally did not feel that that was my experience in Laos, just because I think um, something I learned a lot from talking to Lao colleagues and Lao students is that Laos in general is a country that is not known. You know, in the Southeast Asia region, it's often dismissed or overlooked. It's always Vietnam or Thailand, right? And so when you go into the world and you're like, I'm Lao, they're like, where's that? You know, and so I think for me, I was, I went in expecting to not feel, to feel like I would be treated differently based off of my previous study abroad experiences of having to navigate that with, um, you know, my white counterparts. And so I went in expecting that, um, but I didn't actually get it because something that I really found through my lived experience is that Lao people were so overlooked and did not know that when I told people about my heritage connection, people were so proud and excited about it, that they could relate and be like, wow, I know someone who has home um, connect heritage connections here, who's doing this Fulbright. And I think for me, it was a very pleasant surprise, but I went in ready to like, you know, <laughs> ready to expect it, but I was pleasantly surprised. Um, you know, at the same time, was I treated differently? Yes. I did not get the, the you know, I, I, I still did, you know, kind of feel like um, if I made mistakes, I was, hold, I was held to a different standard. So while I was accepted, I felt like I was held to a different standard before when I disclosed that I did have heritage connection. It became, why don't you know about this? Oh, your parents didn't teach you that? Oh, okay, you should just know this, right? Because you have heritage connections, you know, to Laos. And so um, I hope I, I have some stories I could tell, but I want to make sure that the other panelists get to share too. But I think it's like a yes and, you know, but it came with complications. So that double edged sword, I think, is a really great way to just really summarize um, the experience for me. Yeah, I think that I've spoken how I felt ostracized. But uh, specifically with the US Embassy and other Fulbrighters, 
When I came with locals and especially in my research, I found some positive aspect of it uh, because I was researching women in rural areas, social minorities, and I came into the country knowing both the majority and minority language. So in a sense that my heritage allowed me to connect with these people and to form these very intimate relations um, because I had a familiar face and I spoke their language, some uh, groups that were marginalized felt more comfortable talking to me. So of course there was the aspect where I felt so isolated from the full riders. Uh, I felt that the embassy wasn't giving me as much attention, but this other time I was making such valuable connections because of my multifaceted identity. And I came away um, feeling like my full ride host country is one of my homes. Like I would very confidently say that Uzbekistan is, uh, I wouldn't rank it, but one of my homes. Okay, I'm gonna read off our next question we have here um, that's coming from Jaime and it's, hi, I'm a current ETA in Taiwan. I would define myself as a heritage seeker. I'm mixed Filipino Chinese. I have the privilege of blending in but I do not know the local language, making me feel like an outsider and making it a bit more difficult to connect to my heritage. Do you have any advice for Fulbrighters who are in my situation? Um, this may be our last question depending on time. And I just wanna say again, thank you all so much, but yes, if we could please respond to this question. Unfortunately, I feel like I, I want to answer the question. I just don't share that experience. When I went, I had the language and I can only imagine that it does pose extra difficulties because you do you do get that that, that both those both ends, the negative ends, I think, right? Of being seen as not American, but also not being fully able to connect with, with them through language. And so I would just want to say that we hear you. And I think that that's uh, an experience that might pose additional struggles, et cetera. But um, but I think it's still valuable in and of itself, and, and there's so much to learn from it as well. I can certainly relate to this one just because I have heritage connections to Laos didn't mean that I spoke Lao. So earlier I was sharing about that double-edged sword, right? It's like, okay, you have connections, you should just know, but religiously my parents were not Buddhist. So I knew nothing about like the Buddhist, you know, cultures. And I didn't, Lao language and Hmong language are still very different from each other. So I had to take Lao language lessons. So if I could share one piece of advice um, to this uh, ETA in Taiwan, I'd say use food you know, use food as that cultural connection. For me, I was not fluent in Lao either, but I found that we all, the foods that Lao people ate, my family also ate growing up. And so I used food to be that bridge for me in terms of connecting and um, using it as a vehicle to build commonality. So use food. <laughs> Okay, then maybe actually we have time just for one more question. So I'm, I'm gonna read this one off um, from the chat from Aria. So I, I have a parentheses, probably multi-part question. I'm currently in the process of waiting to hear back about a final notification for a Fulbright ETA to Uzbekistan. And I worry how I'll be perceived as a first generation low-income college student, an American going into a region of the world where blackness and queerness is not a commonly perceived identity, especially in tandem. I feel like I will not be the quote unquote American they expect me to be, especially because I want to bring my Jamaican, my Jamaican heritage to teaching spaces. So if I were to receive the full, right, and I have no idea if I will, I worry about being accepted from multiple perspectives. And I often wonder if I could truly represent any of these sections of the US in a way that does them justice. I apologize for the long multi-part question, but I want to ask, how do you all combat these multiple feelings? So maybe we can end with this question if folks have responses or feelings around how we combat these feelings of representation, of being, of being seen and being known, um, and this question of Americanness. I'm, I'm happy to start not with anything super actionable. Um, so I, I do want to just preface that, and I'm happy. First, I'm sure you have some more insights. Um, and first, just Ari, I think you mentioned before your FSU grad. Um, love that, love that in the house. I also went to FSU, <clears throat> but I think for me that the one thing that I can bring hopefully that's helpful is sort of more of an internal um, power thing that I think is really helpful. Um, just remembering that America for you, and maybe you can even bring that into your lessons and into the way that you 
teach, but America is not just white people. And there is many contributions from the very beginning. And the fact that the greatness of this country was actually built, not particularly by, by white individuals alone, if that's not politically incorrect to say, um, but that these identities are abs absolutely part of the fabric of what it is to be American. And so that's something hugely to be proud of, something that can fuel you and something that I think you can definitely bring into the, into the, um, into the classroom. Yeah, I just um, wanted to add that, first of all, like the historian in me just has to say that um, Blackness and queerness isn't as uncommon as you think in Uzbekistan. There are Black people, there are queer people in the country, there always has been, there still is. So I wouldn't be too afraid of bringing in those aspects of your identity and might even encourage you to explore it. Um, granted, it's a sensitive political situation, um, perhaps even culturally, but there is still opportunities to explore it and bring it. And just was in my own cohort, there were um, POC um, full writers who brought aspects of their identity. So I would say is to be confident um, to build those connections and to not shy away from educating people on what an American is. My experiences might have seemed different because I have the heritage aspect, but I say for those who are POC and don't necessarily identify with heritage to um, own it and to bring it into the classroom and to push the full local embassy to uh, support you because it is their job and responsibility to acknowledge it as well. Yeah, much of that resonates and I, I echo, especially with Shia Bakrish, to, um, and hopefully, you know, you don't have to endure the labor of pushing the embassy. Hopefully like there can also be like folks who are in author roles within that position that can really step up and facilitate um, for you as you also advocate for yourself. So hopefully we can put some things in the work. Well, hopefully when you get your, um, the fellowship notification. So lots of hopes and good vibes um, sending, being sent to you um, and being put out there. And I also wanted to just briefly mention that um, I think, I think part of what I'm hearing from collectively from our experiences too is that like not feeling, how should I say this? I, I'm just gonna blatantly say like, I hope you don't feel the, 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 the baggage or labor of having to represent any section of the US. I think you show up as yourself and do the meaningful work. And, um, and while certainly the sort of label as American and US member definitely is going to you know, shape the dynamics as you navigate it, you know, any, 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 in any space outside of the U.S., um, particularly spaces with, with complex political histories in relation to this country, um, economic and political. I, I think what's, what's important is that you don't, don't feel so burdened to have to necessarily represent the U.S. I think representing yourself, um, your, it sounds like your own cultural heritage the things that you bring into the space, um, um, the vibrancy and, and, and critical importance of your blackness, your queerness, and moving confidently with that. I hope you find kinfolk and, you know, people and community that builds that with you. And that takes time, but, but it does happen. And I hope that is so nourishing for you. But I hope, I guess what I'm saying is, please release the need to feel like you need to represent in the way that, um, I guess, we, we think we should. All right, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you so much um, for this incredible conversation. To all of our panelists, thank you for, for sharing your personal experiences and your knowledge. Um, this is very, you know, as I said earlier, invaluable information to those of us working in the Fulbright program. And I think also for a lot of other people who are part of the program to, to hear these stories and to have this conversation. Um, and I hope that we can do more of this in the future. I hope that this is going to be a beginning of having a more robust conversation about heritage connected and heritage seeking participants in our program. Um, I just want to say and remind everyone that's still here that we will be uh, captioning this and posting it on YouTube. I've put the link in the chat a little bit if you scroll up the chat. 
Um, that YouTube page currently says our last webinar, which was Unmasking Inequalities, but that will be the location uh, where we will post this when it is ready. Um, and I just also wanted to share my email, and I'm sure Jeremy can uh, throw his email in the chat as well. If any of you who are in the audience today are interested in hearing more about these kinds of issues, um, if you have ideas for other panels, please reach out to us and let us know. That's what we are here for in our roles as the diversity and inclusion liaisons um, for our respective regions. Uh, Jeremy, did you have anything you wanted to add before we close today? I again just want to echo what Kelly said. Uh, thank you so much for our panelists. Thank you, Tan, for your excellent moderation. Thank you for our audience members for your incredibly thoughtful questions. Um, you know, we really, part of what Kelly and I are trying to do, as she named, is really doing our best to build more resources. And we see this panel here as something that we hope to just expand and create more um, space to have these conversations. And I just want to again echo how much I appreciate the, the honesty and candor of our panelists to share things that at times I, I can tell probably felt very vulnerable in a moment where it's like in this sort of space and not being sure what to be there, but it felt like y'all held each other. And that was really beautiful to watch and observe as well too. So I just again want to say how much I appreciate um, being part of this and thank you all again. And I appreciate seeing all these comments come in um, from our chat as well too. So that's it. Thank you all so much. We wish you all a wonderful day. Wonderful afternoons, evenings, and mornings. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.